Check out this scene from the movie The Revenant. The movie has no shortage of great shots and breathtaking compositions, but this scene in particular stood out to me because it marked a shift in how we see animals in VFX movies. I think there is a lot of reasons why this scene in particular works so well. First, there is the mesmerizing cinematography of Emmanuel Lubursky and the terrific direction of Alejandro González Iñárritu. And let's not forget about the award-winning performance of Leonardo DiCaprio. But one thing that I think doesn't get enough love is the VFX team and their work on the grizzly bear. There is actually a phrase that says, great CGI is really invisible CGI. And when I first heard this statement a while back, I thought to myself, this couldn't be more true. Because watching audiences reactions over the years, when it comes to CGI in movies, I think this statement can be the absolute truth. People really don't pay attention to things that are created perfectly. Only when something goes wrong does people actually pay attention to what's going on with CGI and why it doesn't work. But when it is great, it is invisible and people don't see it. But this is a topic for another video. Today we're gonna focus on one aspect of this craft, which is how to create CGI animals in movies and how VFX studios do it. Depicting animals on the big screen date as far back as the invention of motion pictures. Actually, if you want to go back further in history, using animals for spectacles was even older than that. But for the purposes of this video, we'll not go that far back. From big monsters to flying horses, the movie industry has no shortage of breathtaking creatures, be it real, fictional, or anything in between. And for simplicity, we're gonna divide animals in movies into two categories. The first is using real animals, but we don't care about those. We care about only the computer-generated ones, and this will include anything and everything that is created digitally. Think of the dinosaurs from Jurassic Park, Godzilla, Hulk, and King Kong. But make no mistake, when we say digital, this will include real animals that are generated digitally, like dogs, for example, in The Call of the Wild, and chimpanzees in the Planet of the Apes movie or franchise of movies. Now, let's start with the first step to create animals. This step will sound very basic, but it is absolutely crucial for the best results. There is a saying that goes something like this, you're only as good as your reference folder, and if someone is asking how many references you need, the answer should be always yes. So needless to say, this step will be necessary to create any animal digitally. A lot of references. VFX studios actually hire people to go out and scout the wilderness for references. If you are making something that already exists, like a grizzly bear, you will have to reference the real bear from wild photography. But if you are creating a fictional animal, you still at least to start from something real. I mean a real foundation and build upon it. For example, in the Skull Island movie, the team referenced a lot of animals when creating the reptilian monster thingy which is called the skull crawler, and it is a hybrid of multiple animals, all of them fused into one, like a Komodo dragon, an alligator, elephant-like skull, and other things maybe. Another example is the aforementioned grizzly bear from the Revenant movie. The ILM team used a video of a grizzly bear attacking a man in a zoo, and they used it as a reference. Creating animals in 3D software is usually done manually from the ground up. So you can create 3D animals or part of it meticulously in great detail and it will involve a mixture of some or all the next steps. We have of course modeling, rigging, animation, grooming, simulation of the skin, muscles, fore movement and everything else in between. Modeling is usually done in 3ds Max, Blender, ZBrush or Maya. Rigging and animation usually is done in Maya only. On the other hand, texturing in Mari, or Substance Painter. For grooming and skin, also muscle simulation, this is usually done with proprietary in-house software like Tissue from Wara Digital. But Ziva Dynamics proved to be a big hitter in Hollywood, which was used in movies like John Wick and the TV series of Game of Thrones. Houdini is also a big contributor in this particular area of VFX nowadays, as a standard for everything that includes creating simulations and it is flexible as much as it is powerful. 
Lately, I've been having problems creating some simulations in Blender. And if you are like me, you probably want to do it in Houdini instead. There are some great resources out there. And after going over this class on Skillshare, Houdini for absolute beginners, I think this is gonna be great to kick off anyone's journey in Houdini. And I was also taking a look at this rain simulation class by Chris Rash, which I think is great too. So Skillshare is an amazing place where you can learn and pick up new skills. It has one of the largest learning communities on the web, with a massive and ever-growing content library. You might be interested in VFX and 3D just like me, but you can also find classes on a plethora of different topics like graphic design, photography, filmmaking, writing, web development, social media, you name it. And for the first 500 people to use our link, will get a one month free Skillshare subscription and you will find all the necessary links in the description. Now back to the video. In the early days, VFX artists had to animate animals manually to create something that tries to mimic the shape and movement of real animals. But that was a far cry from looking convincing till the invention of software such as Ziva and Tissue and many others. This method requires a lot of skills and know-how as you need a ton of reference to mimic the animals that you are trying to portray on the screen. And this method was also used at the beginning of 3D where motion capture suits were not an option. These types of animals look evidently dated when looking through the lens of today. And their animations, while some still somehow hold up, is nowhere near perfect. And the reason being that realistic movement has a lot of moving parts. These subtle things that you might not even notice with the naked eyes are what sells the scenes that we see on the big screen, which takes us to CGI assisted acting through motion capture. This technology opened the door to so much realism because natural movements have a lot of unrelated and subtle movements, and sometimes they can be related and they affect each other. So how do you achieve that level of realism? Well, you capture that and put it through your 3D character. This not only allows you to create much more compelling animals, but also offers a layer of flexibility where animators can come in and exaggerate or alter anything about the capture animation to suit exactly the use case, which is often needed. For instance, if you have seen the Lord of the Rings trilogy, you might not know that Smeagol or Gollum was fully CG, However, the movement and the performance underneath was captured by the one and only Andy Serkis. Andy became a household name after the CGI-assisted acting in the realm of Gollum. And he later went on to play Caesar via motion capture in the Planet of the Apes franchise. The motion capture approach is the industry standard right now. But in the late 90s and early 2000s, people were experimenting a lot with animal animations, but more importantly, with facial animations. The craze of talking animals in Hollywood created a need for a better motion capture lip sync and facial expressions. For instance, in the Planet of the Apes, the human performer both voiced and also played the apes, then the VFX artist had to map those performances to digital ape models trying to match the actor's performance as much as possible while avoiding the movement to look human if that makes sense. One of, one of the biggest VFX studios at the time adopted a workflow where you can track all the actor's movements by putting a lot of tracking points and try to capture their performance. Later on, the performance is mapped out to digital characters trying to stay as faithful as possible to the actor's motions, while factoring in the anatomical differences between the actor and whatever creature is portraying. I hope you guys found this video useful and informative. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. You can also check some of our previous videos. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next one.